Whether it's points, miles, or cash back, who doesn't want to be rewarded for shopping? The lure of getting something extra can encourage people to apply for new credit cards and to use them to score those rewards. In recent years, many credit card rewards programs have become more complex and confusing, and frustrated cardholders have been complaining to federal regulators. I'm Herb Weisbaum, the Consumer Man, a contributing editor at Checkbook.org. Welcome to Consumerpedia at Checkbook.org. We're the nonprofit that helps consumers select services, avoid trouble, and save money. Because we don't accept any advertising or take money from any business we recommend, you can rely on Checkbook.org to be completely independent and objective. Now, here's the host of Consumerpedia, America's consumer expert, the consumer man, Herb Weisbaum. In this episode, we're going to talk about the possibility of new rules to regulate credit card reward programs. It's being considered. We'll focus on airline reward credit cards and look at some of the eye-opening promotional offers. Plus, travel expert Christopher Elliott will join us to explain how chasing travel rewards can actually cost you money. In May, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, issued a report on rewards cards, outlining the numerous problems cardholders are encountering. The agency hosted a public hearing along with the Department of Transportation. Here's a little bit of what Director Rohit Chopra said at that hearing. Credit card companies have focused heavily on ways to entice customers using features other than the real cost of credit, the interest rate and fees they charge. Credit card rewards take center stage in the industry's marketing blitzes, particularly in the form of frequent flyer miles and other proprietary points programs. The largest and most dominant airlines play a massive role in this market. Most of us have witnessed the advertising online, in our mailboxes, on television, and even while seated on an airplane about airline branded credit cards that make promises about frequent flyer mile sign up bonuses, free round trips for you and your family and other travel perks. Frequent flyer programs have evolved from many years ago from a perk for the airline's most loyal customers to a multi-billion dollar currency market where credit card companies and airlines buy, sell, convert, and issue miles and points throughout sectors of the economy. Miles and points can be purchased with cash, earned, and redeemed for shopping on items completely unrelated to flying. These points programs are major assets and competitive weapons for airlines and credit card companies alike. Let's talk more about this with Brad Lipton, Senior Advisor to the General Counsel at the CFPB. He joins us from CFPB headquarters just across the street from the White House in the nation's capital. Very good to talk to you. So I would assume the CFPB is looking into credit card rewards programs because of those consumer complaints you've received, right? That's right. Yeah, we've received over 1,200 complaints in 2023 involving credit card rewards, and our internal calculations suggest that's a more than 70% increase in complaints from pre-pandemic levels about credit card rewards. So when your agency reviewed complaints about rewards cards, you identified four recurring themes, and I'd like to discuss each one of them with you individually. Number one, consumers fail to receive promotional rewards when the financial institutions impose vague or hidden conditions. What's going on there? We're concerned that credit card companies, in particular big companies, make promises to consumers uh, you know, in big print and advertising about sign-on bonuses or other ways that consumers can earn credit card rewards points. But when it comes time for those points actually be rewarded, there's terms and conditions in the fine print that actually make it very hard for consumers to get those points that that they've earned according to the uh, marketing and other uh, big disclosures. From my personal experience, I think that fine print usually is you have to spend like $3,000 within the first three or six months or something like that in order to get those 60 or 70,000 miles that are in the big, bold headline. Is that one of the problems you're talking about? Uh, One of the issues with terms and conditions that we hear from consumers and consumer complaints are issues like gift cards not being allowed to count towards the total amount, things of that nature where consumers are told if they spend a certain amount of money in a certain period of time, they will get a bonus. But it turns out there are certain categories of spending which are carved out in the fine print. And consumers, of course, reading the big print would have no way of knowing that. So there's a qualification goal of how much you have to spend to get the miles. And if you use the card to buy gift cards, that doesn't count. That's right. Okay. That's something a lot of people probably don't know. 
Second area of concern, consumers lose benefits that they previously earned when credit card issuers and merchants devalue rewards. I think we're all aware that with the airline industry, things are always changing with the rewards program. Is that part of what's going on here? Yeah, that's right. We've heard from consumers that issuers, as well as their merchant partners, reduce the value of awards that consumers have already earned. You know, consumers are responsible for paying their credit card bills, and they live up to their end of the bargain. And we're very concerned that consumers complain that companies don't live up to theirs. They devalue points, change the value of them with no notice to consumers, or they remove benefits that consumers have come to expect based on representations from the company. So that's a big concern. So continuing with the most common complaints, number three, consumers face obstacles and receive their preferred redemptions when companies fail to quickly resolve rewards-related issues. So there's not a lot of good customer service going on here when there are problems. Yeah, that's right. One thing I would emphasize here is that we've really seen credit card rewards taking center stage in industry's marketing campaigns lately. That's really been a big change. And another big change that we've seen in this market is the rise of these points cards. About 50% of credit card rewards at this point are on proprietary currencies, things like individual credit card companies' points. And that is seems to have raised a a slew of new issues that consumers have raised for us. And in particular, issues where consumers are promised these points and they're promised that they will be able to transfer them to merchants and use them at those merchants. And then when problems arise, they get caught in what we like to call a doom loop between the credit card company and the merchant. So there's a problem with the transfer portal, the online portal. The credit card company says, call up the merchant, they'll fix it. And then the consumer does what they're told. They call up the merchant and lo and behold, they're sent back to the credit card company and said, call the credit card company. They're the one who has to fix it. And it really puts consumers in an impossible position. And again, just to emphasize, these are consumers who have earned these points. They've been promised these points and it's really not acceptable to us if they're not able to spend them. And number four is probably the most concerning to me consumers suddenly lose rewards when issuers unilaterally revoke previously earned balances. They just pull the plug on your account. Yeah, that's right. Under the terms and conditions of many credit cards, credit card companies are allowed to unilaterally terminate consumer credit card accounts. But the issue we're seeing there as to rewards is that then they take the position that those rewards points go away as well. And so consumers in many cases have saved up thousands or even million rewards points. And then for things completely out of their control and things that are also oftentimes poorly explained to them by credit card companies, the credit card company closes their account and they take the position those rewards just disappear. So when your agency issued this report on rewards credit cards back in May, the report said that the CFPB will continue to monitor credit cards rewards programs and take necessary action on these issues as appropriate. So I assume you're going to look at the marketplace and decide if there's any need for any new regulations to deal with all these problems people are reporting to you. We're really looking at taking these complaints very, very seriously and following up from our joint hearing with the Department of Transportation. We are continuing to review consumer complaints and look into these issues. We've taken enforcement action with respect to credit card rewards. We did a major enforcement action against a large bank in June of 2023. And this is an issue we're very concerned about and are continuing to look at using all of our tools, whether it's enforcement, guidance, regulations. This is something an issue that is concerning to us and we're going to continue to take a hard look at it. And just to be clear, the CFPB is not opposed to rewards credit cards. You're just going to make sure that consumers are not tricked into applying for them and that they get what they're promised. Did I get that right? That's absolutely right. We have really seen credit card rewards taking center stage in industry's marketing campaigns and consumers are living up to their end of the bargain. They're earning these credit card rewards points. We have a lot of evidence they're choosing their credit cards based on the rewards available. And our concern is that consumers should get treated fairly with respect to those points and the credit card companies and merchants who partner with them should live up to their end of the bargain as well. You know, this is also for us a competition issue. One issue that we have seen is that big companies, big credit card companies, big banks have increasingly made themselves exclusive relationships with merchants, uh, entered into exclusive contracts with merchants about uh, how credit card points and rewards are going to be used. That really puts the smaller players in a difficult position. What we hear from them is that they would like to compete on credit card rewards points, but they just don't have the resources of these big companies that lock in these exclusive deals. So there's really uh, a competition angle, but uh, and very much, as you said, a consumer harm angle. We really think that consumers are, uh, who earn what these credit card rewards points should get what they've earned. So if someone listening to this podcast had a problem or believes they weren't treated fairly, they want to complain about a rewards credit card, do you, does the CFPB want to hear from them? 
Would you like them to file a complaint? Absolutely. Uh, please send your listeners, everyone who's listening right now, consumerfinance.gov. If you've had a problem with the consumer financial product or service, including credit cards, including credit card rewards, log on to consumerfinance.gov and file a complaint. We really read those complaints. They drive all of our work, enforcement, guidance, policy. We are absolutely interested in listening to consumers. And I can just tell you from firsthand experience, those complaints really drive the work of the agency. And we are absolutely dedicated to making sure that consumers are treated fairly, particularly with respect to credit card rewards. So please, please, please log on and let us know if you've had these issues. Brad Lipton with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The CFPB is a very active regulatory agency that tries to make consumer financial products work for us and the economy as a whole. Brad, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on. Now, following that CFPB report on rewards cards in May, the American Bankers Association said consumers like rewards credit cards. The ABA accused the agency of putting politics over policy. In a statement, the association said, quote, if the Bureau wants to truly help consumers, it should start by defending the credit card rewards programs that Americans use every day to stretch their dollars and help make ends meet, end of quote. Up next, there are benefits to having a travel rewards card, sometimes for some people. We'll talk about that next. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll consider being a Consumerpedia supporter by using the link at the bottom of the show notes to make a small contribution each month. This is Consumerpedia. Airline frequent flyer programs started out as a simple but powerful way to build customer loyalty. Get award miles based on how far you flew. Earn enough miles and you could redeem them for various types of award seats. These frequent flyer programs are still going strong, but today the airlines are pushing their rewards credit cards, and they offer some big bonuses to do that. Our next guest, Stephen Carvel, is a finance professor at the SC Johnson College of Business at Cornell University. Hi, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Airline rewards cards have become a big revenue source for many airlines. How much are we talking about? What percentage of their income these days? Well, I think it varies. They get pre-purchased miles from the banks that they do business with. So it's 10, 15%. So is that why we have flight attendants hawking the airline's credit card before we land on every flight? If you ask me to say explicitly, I'm, I'm unsure of it, but I believe for the flight crew, it's a bonus program. Of course, from the airline's point of view, their, their motivation is to make sure that as many people as possible are signed up. They have a captive audience. But in the old days, they wanted to sign up because they wanted the loyalty. Now it's because they're making so much revenue from it. I think, you know, from the standpoint of an airline, they look at loyalty in a spectrum. They want to create a marginal motivation to fly on United or fly on American if possible. And that's how they view that process. So unlike the original frequent flyer programs, which required you to buy a ticket and fly, you can earn points or miles just by using the card to buy groceries or gasoline or whatever. But the airlines are fine with that because they make money every time you use the card. Right. Every time you use the card, uh, the merchant who is uh, accepting that credit card is usually paying somewhere around 2 to 3% off of the top of the revenue stream. And that money goes to the bank and then the bank will, you know, share some of it with the airline. That's a lot of money. You know, there's a lot, you know, if you think of how many millions of people have the card and how many thousands of dollars they charge possibly a month, that adds up to a lot of money. While miles have become in a way a form of currency, they're not really worth anything unless you earn enough of them to use them. And unless you fly a lot, that may not be easy to do. Yeah, you know, I don't know. It depends on what you want to do. You can usually get an upgrade. So, you know, that's a possible use of the miles, even if you're not getting an entire free trip. Uh, But yeah, I mean, if you're only going to use 10,000 miles a year, it's not going to add up to much. It's going to take you a few years to get a free flight. There's nothing to stop the airlines from changing the goalposts for how many miles it takes for a reward years after you started earning them. Your currency has been devalued. Why are they doing this? Why aren't they afraid of annoying their customers? Well, I think uh, as more and more people accrue more and more miles, those miles actually translate into liabilities, you know, whether it's for a hotel, for points or on points on an airline. That's just a way for them to control that growing liability every once in a while. Plus, as you just mentioned, if the flights are generally full, You know, it's not like you're translating those miles for an empty seat. You're displacing a paying customer by translating the miles. And then they look at that and say, okay, what is the reasonable opportunity cost of the seat that you're trying to buy? 
and then they might raise the number of miles required to buy it. I know that some people feel like it should be immutable, but of course it says in the contract that it isn't, or it says in the literature that it's not, that they have the ability to do that from time to time. Some of them are doing it now, not just by the leg, but by the number of miles on the leg. So they have different ways of adjusting it. So what do you see down the road? Will airlines continue to be as aggressive with their marketing of these co-branded credit cards? You know, I think that we're finding already, if you look at the statistics, that more and more people are topping out on their credit card limits, meaning that they're not going to qualify. Their credit ratings are going down for a large part of the population. And then the rest of people have already chosen the people who have really high FICO scores, et cetera, they already have one or two cards that they're using as their preference cards. So I think the, the number of ads is going to start dropping and therefore they're not going to be paying as much attention to adding more and more people because the yield on that ask is going to keep on dropping. And I think we're probably already seeing that. So what are they going to do? They're going to keep on getting me to figure out ways to use my card more often. Any other thoughts you have about these uh, reward airline reward credit cards? I think people should look at it and say that having the card as an intermittent traveler, you'll have a higher probability of not having to stress out about them not having room for your luggage. I have an American Airlines card. I think it costs me $79 a year to have the card. And part of the uh, benefits of having that card gets me immediately, regardless of my status, a zone four boarding. You know, so at some level, at least maybe also that $79, if I'm a reasonable traveler, it means that there'll be likely room at, on the overhead for my baggage, you know, when I get on the plane, as opposed to people who are boarding zone five or six or seven. And, you know, uh, if I get a free flight every once in a while, every year or so, or every two years, that's a bonus on top of that. So I would almost look at it as this is a way for me to uh, have a lower stress travel, less likely to be bumped automatically off the flight, things like that. And you may also get free luggage uh, or possibly some other perks. Yeah, yeah. One or two bags, free check. Those are the perks. It costs you $79 a year or $99 a year, depending on which kind of card you're using. Yeah, those benefits might just be worth it on their own. Stephen Carvel is a finance professor at the SC Johnson College of Business at Cornell University. Thank you for spending time with us today. Happy to do it. Have a great day. Up next, travel expert Christopher Elliott joins us from somewhere in Europe to talk about why he is not a fan of travel rewards cards. I'm Herb Weisbaum, the Consumer Man, and this is Consumerpedia, powered by Checkbook.org. Consumerpedia Fast Facts. When comparing rewards cards, figure out what they're really giving you. With a 3% cashback card, you get $3 back for every $100 you spend. The value of the points or miles you earn for that same purchase might not be worth $3. Here are some of the ways you may be able to redeem your credit card rewards. As a statement credit, deposit to a bank account, buy gift cards or merchandise, pay for hotel rooms or airline tickets, and donate to charity. When deciding how to use your points, CNBC suggests trying to get a one-to-one -one value, meaning one point or mile is worth a penny. To calculate if you're getting a one-to-one -one value, take the cost of the redemption item, such as a gift card or travel reservation, and divide it by how many points or miles are needed. We couldn't discuss travel rewards without talking to a good friend of this podcast, syndicated travel columnist Christopher Elliott. His on-travel column appears in USA Today and newspapers across the country. Chris not only writes about travel, he's been traveling around the world full-time since 2017. Hello, Herb. How are you? So, where in the world are you this time? Uh, this time I'm in Berlin, Germany, the capital. So when we spoke to you in April for the travel show, you were in beautiful Curacao off the coast of Venezuela. Before that, New Zealand. How many miles do you think you rack up in a year? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. In the last year, I've been around the world at least once. So uh, whatever that is, um, uh, probably much more than that. And uh, yeah, that's a lot of miles or kilometers. And being a traveling man, as Ricky Nelson would say, if you're old enough to get that musical reference, way to go. You must be totally focused on how many airline miles and hotel points you can accumulate. <laughs> Wrong. No, I'm not. Actually, I, I have a somewhat tortured relationship with loyalty programs. I dabbled in them at the start of my travel journalism career and then decided that they were not right for me and since then have been uh, on record as a 
loyalty program endpoints skeptic. And why are you skeptical? What's your concern? You know, I think that loyalty programs are good for some people. If you are a frequent flyer, as the name implies, then you should probably be participating in a frequent flyer or frequent stayer program. But for the rest of us, they really are marketing programs that are meant to get you to spend more money and to spend money mindlessly on that particular product, whether it's an airline ticket or a hotel room. And I think that on balance, that's bad for customers. So you're saying rewards cloud your judgment when it comes to finding the best price for flights and hotel rooms. Exactly. It short circuits your common sense. So you say, hey, I've, I'm participating in Hilton or Delta or American Airlines. So you start making decisions based on how many points you can get. And where it really starts to get crazy is when you have these credit cards where you get one point per every dollar spent. And that's when you start spending a lot more money that you probably wouldn't normally be spending. That's where it gets into crazy territory where you know people are spending a lot to get the points, to get the miles, and then maybe ending up with a huge balance on their credit card that they can't pay off. Or you get that promotional offer, 70,000 miles, and you sign up for the card, and then you realize you only get them if you spend $3,000 in the first six months. You find yourself with a clock ticking down, so you go out and buy stuff you wouldn't ordinarily buy because you want those miles. Oh, Herb, we could spend hours talking about loyalty programs, but I'm not going to bore you. But certainly, yes, that's one of the gotchas there is that you get these offers and you think, oh, look, I'm going to fly somewhere for free. But there's always a catch. And it's like Las Vegas. The house always wins. These programs are created to benefit the airlines and the shareholders. They're not there necessarily to benefit you. So how do you feel about airlines changing the rules when it comes to how miles are accumulated or how many are needed for an upgrade? I don't feel very good about it. To put it mildly, if you want uh, some light reading, you should read the, the program agreement for your uh, loyalty program. It tells you that the company can change its rules at any time and for any reason. It'll also tell you that the points don't belong to you. They belong to the company and that they can confiscate them or close your account for any reason. They don't even need to tell you why. Hmm. So these are just some of the absurd rules that we agree to when we're participating in a program. If you have any doubts about whether these programs are good for you, read the program agreement that you signed onto when you became a, a loyal customer, and you'll, you'll realize very quickly that uh, you're not the beneficiary necessarily. And there are some benefits to an airline credit card. They can provide some nice perks if you fly enough to justify the annual fee, such as free check bags, reimbursing you for the cost of applying for TSA pre-check. Some offer companion fares. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily buy into the marketing language where they say, for example, you get a free check bag. I think that you're paying, you know, an, an annual fee to have the card and that that's a, one of the benefits of having it, but they're not giving away free check bags necessarily. Um, but yes, you can get some benefits from it. If you're going to fly, you know, Alaska Airlines is a good example. Alaska is one of the better airlines and their loyalty program is one of the least offensive in my mind. If you're going to you know, fly a lot on Alaska Airlines. Yeah, good idea to participate in its loyalty program. Read the fine print carefully on the credit card because, you know, the cards, that's a totally different animal. Uh, you know, you've got the APR you've got to worry about and the annual fee. And it may be a good deal for you and it may not. I mean, you, you may get a better deal with your credit union or bank. So don't automatically assume that just because you can collect miles that it's going to be a good deal for you. We want to remind listeners that you shouldn't even consider a rewards card unless you pay your bill off in full each month. Otherwise, you're going to lose money because of the interest. Yet, if you can't pay it off, do not spend it because that's when the uh, credit card companies and the airlines or hotels really start to do very well uh, when you've got a, a balance that hasn't been paid off and the interest starts to accrue. That's just madness. For those who do pay the balance in full each month, Checkbook recommends a rewards card with no annual fee that pays cash back. We feel that money is always better than points you may not be able to use. Would you agree? The problem with points is that the goalposts keep getting moved. So if you can get a flight for 25,000, 30,000 points today, there's no guarantee that in a year's time or two years time, you're going to be able to get the same flight for the same amount of points. In fact, most airlines have already started going to more of a dynamic system where it's based on the demand and you may have to spend a whole lot more. So no, uh, money is always better than points for sure. 
And by the way, I have a rewards credit card with the airline I travel most often. I have frequent flyer programs with the rest. I don't ever get enough miles to really do anything, but what I do is I give them to charity at the end of the year, like Make-A-Wish. They can really use them. It's not tax deductible, but it certainly helps out organizations that really need the points or miles. If you travel that much, you should be collecting miles just kind of like as a byproduct of your travels. Whether you use them or not is really up to you. If it makes sense, you should. What you shouldn't do, and I know a lot of people will, they won't have enough miles, so they'll end up buying more miles so that they can get a free ticket. And I'm using free in air quotes. <laughs> That's also madness. You don't want to be doing that. Only you know redeem your points if you're going to get something for it. And if not, I like your idea of donating the points. So where are you off to next? Stockholm, Sweden is my next stop. So Chris, how do people find you on the web? My website is uh, elliotadvocacy.org. So it's E-L-L-I-O-T-T, -T, two L's, two T's, advocacy.org. I have a team of people there who help for free. We have a nonprofit organization. We help people when they have consumer problems. You can also read my stories every day on the Elliot Report, which is just elliot.org, E-L-L-I-O-T-T -T dot O-R-G. Always great to talk to you and safe travels, my friend. Okay, thanks. Before we go, here are some other Consumer PD episodes that might be of interest. Number 62, The Travel Show. That's where we talk to Chris. Number 50, Finding a Credit Card That's Right for You. And number 41, Finding the Best Hotel Rates. And with that, we've arrived at our gate. We hope you'll rate this episode and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Remember, we release new episodes every other Thursday. Another way you can support this show is to follow us on Consumerpedia on Facebook and Instagram and My Consumerpedia on X, formerly Twitter. I'm Herb Weisbaum. Thanks for listening. Consumerpedia is a public service of Checkbook.org. We're a unique nonprofit that helps you save money and make smarter choices. You can count on Checkbook to help you find the best services and avoid the worst with local ratings that are accurate and unbiased. If you live in or around these seven cities and haven't joined Checkbook yet, Check us out. Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, Seattle, San Francisco, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Washington, D.C. To get your free 30-day subscription, go to checkbook.org slash consumerpedia. If you like what you've heard, we hope you'll become a supporter by using the link at the bottom of the show notes to make a small contribution each month. Consumerpedia, empowering consumers to save money and make smarter choices.